floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our next panel in this series of panels. This one is on sports diplomacy and its impact on shaping international relations. We are happy to have you here with us, and we're excited to learn from our panelists today who aren't just experts in their field, but are also passionate about talking about sports and its impact in developing our society today. So thank you so much for being with us. Engage with us, ask us your questions, give us the opportunity to answer them, and give us the opportunity to learn from you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we proceed further, we will have one of the uh, members of the US Embassy, uh, who, Mr. Ryan Murphy, who is basically from Washington DC and is the program officer and works with the uh, pro uh, sports diplomacy in, uh, team in the United States. Uh, Ryan, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. So thank you all for, for tuning in. Uh, as Hansa said, my name is Ryan Murphy. I work within the Sports Diplomacy Division at the US Department of State. I'm based in Washington, DC, and we are within the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Our federal mandate from Congress is people to people exchanges, and we use sports as that medium. The office was stood up in 2002 uh, to do outreach through sports, uh, through these two-way people to people exchanges. We started doing this through what we call the International Sports Programming Initiative, which is a, a sports grants competition. And that is given out to US-based nonprofit organizations and universities that help us implement these two-way exchanges. We also have uh, three other programs that we highlight. Our Sports Visitor Program, which is an inbound program to the US. We work with the US embassies and consulates to identify uh, youth athletes and coaches that will travel to the US for about a two week sports cultural exchange. On the flip side, our sports envoy program, we work with the US leagues and federations to identify athletes and coaches to travel overseas to work with the US embassies and consulates to deliver public diplomacy messaging, uh, perform camps and clinics and really engage underserved underprivileged communities overseas. And then our last program is our Global Sports Mentorship Program, which is a month long mentorship uh, opportunity for both women and girls, as well as those in the disability sports field to come to the US for a month long job shadow uh, with a number of US American entities and companies. The relationship with Qatar is, is very good one with the U United States. Um, in the lead up to the Qatar FIFA World Cup in 2022, we will work with the embassy on a number of programs and engagement uh, with US athletes and coaches and administrators. Uh, one specific program we have is with the International Sports Programming Initiative. We will be doing a two way exchange program with Qataris and also sending Americans over there uh, for this two way exchange. So really in a nutshell, that's the way we use sports diplomacy. Uh, I'm happy to be introducing this panel and, and having these great experts within the field uh, to talk about it a little bit further. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you for that introduction. B without further ado, let's move on and introduce the stars of today's show, which are our panelists. Uh, our first panelist of today is Dr. Craig LeMay. Uh, professor LeMay is currently a professor in residence at Northwestern University in Qatar, but he's originally from uh, the main campus in uh, Evanston and is a professor with the Middle School of Journalism. Uh, Dr. LeMay isn't just a professor, he's also an author, he's a journalist, and we're really happy to have him with us today. Our next panelist for today is Dr. Daniel Reiche. Uh, professor Raishi is a professor at Georgetown University in Qatar uh, in residence right now, uh, but he is on leave from the American University of Beirut. He works on sports politics and policy and energy, and we are really excited to have you with us today. Our next panelist for today is Amal Saleh. She is not just an athlete, 
and a part of Qatar's national football uh, basketball team, but she is also uh, the first female referee from Qatar and also has achieved many gold medals in the GCC games, etc. Our last panelist for today is Ms. Kathleen Bates. She work, currently works with Qatar Foundation and is the uh, and is a senior uh, uh, aquatic uh, specialist, and has developed the ability friendly program and has developed many other initiatives for uh, people with disabilities and their inclusion in the world of sports in Qatar. Uh, we're delighted to have you, and we are excited to learn from all of our panelists to discuss with them the impact that sports has in making our societies evolve, especially with reference to politics and uh, inclusion. So thank you for joining us today. Our first question for all our panelists is describe your journey for us. Tell us how you began to do what you're doing today. Why did you become interested in sports how did you become interested in politics and how do you connect the two? So Dr. LeMay, over to you. Sure, thank you. Thank you all, it's a pleasure to be here. I actually got interested in sports the same way many people did. I played them all through high school and university. But also as a reporter, I've, I've traveled around the world and I've spent in many conflict zones. And it, uh, just as an observer, it was interesting to me to watch how people play, whether they're in refugee camps, POW camps, combat, uh, I was in Belgrade for a long time when it was not a good thing to be an American there. And I could watch NBA games there with my Serb colleagues and everything was fine. And basketball is the same whether you're in Boston, Beijing or Belgrade. So that was where I first became uh, enamored of the idea of sports diplomacy. But that was my introduction to sports. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Dr. Raishi, can you tell us a little about your journey? How did you become interested in sports? Why do you research into what you research into? Well, first of all, I always liked doing sports. Uh, as a kid, I was a passionate table tennis player. Uh, and I even became a regional champion uh, in the age of 12 in Germany in table tennis. And um, as a scholar, um, uh, I, uh, all my degrees are on environment and energy policy. Uh, but when I moved to Lebanon in 2008, I noticed uh, how politicized uh, Lebanese sports is. For example, the sports team, they would have uh, shirts in the color of the party that is supporting them. So I published a first article entitled uh, War Minus the Shooting, the Politics of Sport in Lebanon in 2011 in the uh, journal Third World Quarterly. And since then, uh, it became a main focus of my research uh, and now leading the World Cup Research Initiative at Georgetown, Qatar. That sounds fascinating. Um, Kathleen, you've broken many glass ceilings. You have spoken about people with disabilities and inclusion when that's not really a part of our mainstream conversations today. Uh, so can you tell us a little about your journey from coach to working as an administrator of a program that is used by hundreds of people at this point. Sure, I'd be happy to, Hansa. I, growing up, like the others said, I was always involved in sports. I don't ever remember a time I wasn't on a team or in a club or it, it was just a part of, of myself growing up. Um, when I was in college, I was a volunteer at an outdoor center for people with disabilities and it just, really piqued my interest. I, I, I didn't grow up with anyone around me immediately that had a disability. And I was fascinated to see how blind people were skiing and scuba diving. And I, it, just, it just blew my mind, honestly. That's where I got interested in it. And as I continued on getting involved with working and continuing my own interest in sports, I always was trying to partner those two together. And so the opportunity in Qatar has been wonderful for for trying to pursue programs for people around sports and on the inclusion side of things. And so it's just been a, a kind of the perfect combination of need in a country where we don't have programs like that, 
and it's just been a personal interest and passion of mine for a really long time trying to, to bring those programs to life. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, I think it's really important to realize that sports has an immense impact in not just making us fit and making us, you know, able to climb more than 10 sets of stairs a day, but also in uniting our communities, in promoting, in promoting inclusivity, in bringing us all together. So um, my next question is, again, for all of our panelists, if you could describe for us an experience where you saw sports promoting uh, inclusivity, sports uniting communities, um, and just breaking barriers, whereas in other parts of societies, these barriers still existed. Dr. LeMay. Well, in terms of inclusivity, there's probably lots of examples. Uh, but the one that I, I've been witness to my entire life is uh, the inclusion of women in sport. Uh, so I'm old. So when I was a kid, girls did not play sports. They just didn't. Uh, maybe they played track and maybe they were in track and field or something like this. But the girls I went to high school with did not play sports. When my boys went to high school, all the girls played sports. And they were transformed by it, both as uh, in their academic lives and in their personal lives. So to watch that transformation over, uh, I guess, two generations was an extraordinary thing. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think it's really interesting that with the evolution of the feminist movement and with the evolution of the cause of women's rights, uh, traditionally something that was seen as being male dominated or just for men has sort of widened its scope and has tried in one sense to level the playing field between men and women um, and just bring them all together on some level at least. Um, so. Thank you for sharing, uh, Dr. Can go can ahead. I just, can I add real quick? I, my, one of the great joys of being at NUQ is I am the women's basketball coach here. So I am now a Big Ten basketball coach and nobody knows, nobody can say different, but it's an it's extraordinary experience. It's a lot of fun. Um, absolutely. I mean, there's something to be said about coaching a team of women who aren't just passionate about playing, but also have found a lot of aspects of their identity and a lot of empowerment just through playing sports and just through this ability to express themselves, the ability to interact with their teammates and just participate in something that they were excluded from prior to, uh, you know, uh, sports becoming more inclusive. Um, Dr. Haishe, can you tell us a little about your journey and if you've noticed uh, sports and its inclusion having any impact. Promoting women in sport uh, is very important to me. And um, I believe that uh, sports is a human right and everybody should have the opportunity to practice the sport he or she wants to practice. Uh, I just had the last podcast on our uh, World Cup 2022 podcast series on women's football in Qatar and was interviewing for Georgetown uh, students, uh, female students who play football. So um, this is certainly an area where we need more progress in Qatar uh, to give women more opportunities when it comes to sport. When you ask me as a scholar, apart from promoting uh, women's sport, I would like to highlight uh, the refugee team at the 2016 Summer Olympic Games, which I found a remarkable uh, achievement uh, since sport is linked to nationality. And you to qualify for the Olympics, you need to qualify in national championships. But what if you are a refugee and escape from a country? Uh, so by uh, having the refugee team, the IOC really filled uh, 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 an important gap in global sports to giving the opportunity to people who left their countries for good reasons because of war uh, to still compete to still compete in um, in the Olympics. And I'm very glad to see that the IOC is also having a refugee team at the next Summer Olympic Games in Tokyo, Japan. So we've heard about how sports promote inclusivity for women. We've heard about how it sort of, uh, sort of 
you know, decreases the gap of being a citizen, of being a refugee, and sort of unites communities in that sense. And going back to Kathleen and her important work of bringing sports to the disability community, Kathleen, can you tell us a little about sports and how it has uh, maybe incidents and maybe um, how it promotes uh, inclusivity for the disability community because they're often on, in the peripheries of society um, spoken about in very specific contexts and spoken to in very specific contexts. Um, in Qatar, we are really pushing societal changes and we are pushing those towards inclusion and accessibility for everybody in sport. We are targeting right now on, in the sports field because we think that that's an equalizer. There's a lot of ability groups that can, can participate and, and be involved and compete at the same level with just you know, a few modifications, which is what we're, we're really pushing. Um, we have seen tremendous growth and interest in this field in the last you know, eight to 10 years in Qatar, it's really changed. And things are a lot different today than they were. I mean, the fact that we're even having this conversation on this medium with the US government and, and the embassy involved is, is major. It really shows that things are changing here and we're pushing that every single day, trying to make things you know, better and better in a country that you know, is just a bit behind you know, than some of the Western, the more Western countries, but it is changing. And we believe that sports is kind of the best way to, to show those changes. We're providing programs right now to equal, nearly equal numbers of male, male and females with a you know, wide variety of ability groups. And it seems every week the, the participation numbers grow and the families themselves are, you can see it in the numbers of participants. It's, it, there's, a, there's a massive need for what we're doing. And we're also seeing higher level support through organizations like Qatar Foundation. They're now also really getting behind the movement towards inclusion and accessibility. And without kind of that, that high level support, we, we wouldn't be able to move as fast as we are. But because we are, we're in a country and a region that is, the, the growth is phenomenal because of the need and the impact that, that our programs are making. Thank you, Kathleen. You just described a very important thing, which is that, I mean, in each and every society, whether that is in the East or the West, there are certain things we need to improve on. Uh, we've, we've hosted a series of panels for the past couple months, and I think they've been on you know, things ranging from uh, the civil rights movement to the role of elections and uh, you know, the inclusion of people with disabilities in general. And in all of those, we've realized that there's a lot we need to do wherever we are in whichever part of the world we are. There's a lot that we need to do in terms of um, inclusion, in terms of making sure that all aspects of our society, all people within the society, regardless of where they come from, are included, are empowered, and are always thought of in every aspect. So um, you just mentioned that within that sort of movement of evolution, uh, within that exchange, sports plays a vital role. My question is, why does sport, sports play a vital role? What is so special about sports that nothing else has? Dr. Lemay, perhaps you could begin by answering this question. I'll give it a shot. Well, the first one is that sport bridges cultural and linguistic uh, differences like nothing else. Uh, to my NBA example I gave you a little while ago. You can watch sports anyway. Basketball is the same game wherever I watch it. But also it's a fantastic media product. Sports is about telling a story and uh, sports is inherently about conflict. It has good guys, my team, bad guys, your team. It has heroes and goats. It has a beginning and an end. It's visually arresting. Sports itself is just a very powerful medium for communication. So, um, Dr. Amey, you just told us sports tells a story of conflict, of progress, of evolution, and with the lens of this panel, of inclusion. But why else is it important? Uh, Dr. Gaishe, perhaps you could add on to it? 
I think sport is a universal language. Uh, I, very often, uh, I have the situation, I'm sitting in an Uber, for example, and the driver would ask me where I am from. And then I say from Germany, and he would then name a German football player. And we start having a discussion on football, on a specific World Cup match. That's fantastic. There's nothing else uh, that can do that. And uh, for me personally, uh, apart from my scholarship, um, following sport, I mean, apart from practicing sport my lot, uh, a lot myself, uh, for me also sport is a bit of a daily soap, you know. I have my favorite football club uh, from uh, Germany, Hanover 96, which is my city of birth where I grew up, where I did all my degrees. That's the first thing I do in the morning that I check the news on the club and everything is to me so important. And I have a WhatsApp group with friends where we discuss all minor issues in detail. So I couldn't live without that, I have to admit. So sports tells us a story. Sports takes us back to where we came from, which is our home, keeps us up to date and sports help us communicate with those we know nothing about, whose language we don't know, whose identity and culture we don't share. Um, but how does it help bridge barriers? Kathleen, can you tell us a little about your work with people with disabilities? How does the Ability Friendly Program specifically mend a gap that nothing else can mend? What is so special and what is so important about sports that your wait lists are always full? Because I know for a fact, I've been on that wait list for a while. And I know that there is a long queue of people who are interested, who are passionate about participating in your programs. I think that um, part of the answer to that is within a family, if there are, we have a lot of families who have twins, even triplets and possibly one has a special need or a disability and then the other twin might not. And when you can get both siblings or all three siblings in the water or on the football pitch, it's a real equalizer. Then suddenly they're doing this activity together that they, they, maybe they, they didn't know how to do before or nobody took the time to help them figure out how to, how to be on a football team, how to be on a swimming team. Um, and so we're seeing that as an equalizer. So. You know, Hansa, even speaking to you personally, if you have a sibling and your sibling knows how to swim and you don't, and then suddenly you are able to get a spot in our swimming program, and then, and then you're able to swim with your sister or your sibling, it's a real equalizer. It's a real, it's something that families then can do together in their social time and their free time. And we see that that is just so valuable. We get videos and photos all the time of families out on vacations or you know, on the weekends doing things together that they weren't able to do before necessarily all together. You would see the, 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 the child who has a, you know, a special need or a disability sitting on the side. Um, we've seen it in mainstream schools where there might be a child with a disability who doesn't get to participate in the PE classes and they're, they're genuinely left on the side. And, and with just some minor adaptions, they could be included and part of the class and part of the activity. And so I think, you know, what, what, what's made us so popular is just showing that it's not, we're not having to, you know, put people on Mars, we can just make some few minor changes. And then inclusion is, is, is possible. Um, but really, it's a, it's a real equalizer. And it, you know, it gives it's, we're showing that people are gaining self confidence, they're gaining life skills, they're especially in the water, you know, it, we're, we're teaching water safety and we're able to save lives. Um, you know, drowning is the number one cause of death for people with autism, international statistic. And just through some basic learn to swim, we're able to, to reverse, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of possible accidents. So we just see it as just so important that people have opportunities to participate in in sports, just the same, you know, that we were all fortunate to grow up, you know, being included in. So something really interesting that you just mentioned is that sports is an equalizer. So it unites communities, it sort of blurs boundaries, so to say, and 
that's just not limited to a social sphere, but also helps people get basic life skills such as getting trained so that they don't drown if they have autism and if they aren't able to extract themselves from a, you know, a sort of dangerous situation. Um, so we've heard a lot about how sports promotes inclusion, how it ex equips us with these skills, how it unites us, how it tells our story, how it sort of takes us beyond borders, but how is it connected with politics and how is it connected with diplomacy? So let's hear from Dr. LeMay about how sports helps unify or sort of promote the cause of the feminist movement. Dr. LeMay, you spoke to us about how, you know, when you were playing sports, you didn't notice a lot of women doing so. But when your sons were playing sports, you noticed that women's participation had increased. How do you think it impacts the broader feminist movement? And what has led to this change? Why do you see more women in this arena now? Um, well, certainly a lot of it is legal change. In the United States, uh, the change to the education laws enabled women to play more sports. Uh, but then you've had an international movement. Uh, the IOC is committed to having parity for men's and women's sports in 2024. Um, but I've also, there, there have been any number of UN declarations about uh, women in sport. I just think it's been a focus of uh, international concern for some years. Sport, you know, sport enables conversations that we either don't have or that are awkward to have sometimes. In my own country, the United States, a race is a difficult conversation. Sport actually makes that conversation easier and it certainly encourages it. Um, human rights has not been at the forefront of uh, sport in the way it is right now since the anti-apartheid movement 60 years ago. Sports actually enables conversations that lead to change, including here in Qatar, legal change. You're, you're muted, Kansa. But you're muted, yeah, Kansa. Well, I think that's really interesting uh, that you mentioned race. Can you, Dr. LeMay, tell us a little more about how you think it begins or it starts that conversation or acts as a launching pad for that conversation around race, perhaps with some examples? Well, sure. I'll, oh, I'm sorry. Was that to me, Hansa? Yes. Okay. Well, I did a project with my students in the U.S. some years ago. A big think tank had done a list of the 100 most important events in American history. Not a single one of them was sports related. That's just not possible in my country. It's just not possible. So we did our own list and published it of the, of the most important sporting events in the United States. And I don't mean games, I mean actual uh, sporting events. And almost all of them have to do with race, whether it has to do with the, the Jim Crow era in which African-Americans are driven out of sports, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, you name it. But uh, it, it promoted a conversation about race, which is central to the American narrative. Um, Dr. Raisha, what do you think? How do you think sports has impacted the broader feminist movement, but also our conversations around race and around inclusivity in that sense? Well, when we look at the role of sports and in international affairs, yes, it can unite people, but it can also divide them. So a positive impact is not an automatic process. So we have examples for both. We have the foot, so-called football war between Honduras and El Salvador in 1969 around uh, FIFA World Cup qualifying matches. And it lasted 11 years until these two countries uh, signed a peace agreement. In 2009, we had the matches between Egypt and Algeria with violent attacks on uh, Algerian fans. But then we had, for example, the so-called ping pong diplomacy in the early 70s when around a table tennis match between China and the US, uh, the first visit of an American uh, president in China happened. Um, and um, so it always depends. And But governments can use sport as a tool for collaboration with other countries. But I believe it must be integrated into a general approach of um, um, collaboration. And um, 
Qatar is a country that is using sport for improving its relations with uh, other countries. Uh, but just sport alone cannot do the job. It needs to be integrated in a general strategy, which is the case in Qatar, which is following, I believe, a very multilateral approach by actively participating in international institutions, financially supporting international institutions, being a mediator for international conflicts. So here, sport is part of a general approach, a multilateral uh, approach. So absolutely, I think uh, in Qatar, we do see that sports is taken very seriously and it plays a major role in shaping the country's narrative. And I think uh, it's, it's, it'll be very interesting for us to get Amal's perspective here because Amal represents Qatar and uh, doesn't just isn't just the first female referee, but is also a part of Qatar's national basketball team. So Amal, can you talk to us a little more about your experience? Uh, tell us a little more about how you think uh, you know sports impacts the women's rights movement here. Um, how has it impacted it personally for you, um, and what your experience has been like? Yes, thank you, Kenny. Actually, as my colleague, they explain it, the sport is playing in a different culture. Like sport, what is a good of it? It's, uh, it's don't have any religion or uh, like a culture thing. It's gathering all the people in one place with one role to do. It's only to play sport with the peace. For from my perspective, I saw a lot of things in my life with the sport and especially it changed a lot in Qatar. For example, in the beginning, we start uh, like with the culture thing, the hijab, and the wearing clothes. And we respect the society and where we are came from in the beginning. Because in our religion, it's not allowed for the woman to participate. But in the, after that, we discuss with the people and we will see that with our family and parents that we can do something to our country. So we figure out to play sport. Uh, actually, from my side, my family, they playing, one of my uh, siblings is playing a basketball. So I was playing with him. Then my father and my mother, they support me and also my coach and my, uh, my master in uh, martial art, also he support me to do the sport. Since from there, I have the support from the society and my family. And women, she need the both of them, the society and the culture, also their family. Therefore, I have a journey. Actually, there is some like challenges that, you know, as the Gulf people, uh, as a Gulf in the woman, they cannot do, they thinking they cannot do nothing. But after that, with the sport, we accept the challenge. We change a lot of things. Now, as you see, I am the first FIBA female referee in Qatar. And there is a lot of female coming. Also is my sister. She's became now the first uh, FIBA uh, boxer also. So uh, the moving in, in the sport in Qatar, and especially it's taking a good role also with the, from the highness, Sheikh Hamoza also and uh, supporting from the Sheikh Duan and Sheikh Tamim, and they're giving us a good support from the government, also from the society. From uh, my perspective, I'm seeing that the sport is playing a good role model in our country, and they're giving us the role model for the female, both, and the male side. So this is a small part what I, uh, uh, from my journey that I saw it in my life. With the support of family, with the support of those in power, and with the help of role models, we have seen a huge evolution and we have seen more women breaking the glass ceiling and participating in sports. Um, Kathleen, how do you think sports has benefited the larger disability rights movement on the whole? We've, we've uh, realized how individuals, but how has it impacted the larger disability rights movement? I think that uh, I'm really speaking specifically in Qatar. I think that it's helped blur some of those boundaries. I think that it's helping um, cross some of those lines um, and kind of bridge the barriers. I think like we've, we've kind of all said, it's a real universal language. Um, and that it's just, it's, it's just helping drive further movements towards inclusion um, and accessibility. You know, the disability rights movement is, is there to try to 
you know, push empowerment and kind of take away some of these boundaries. And I think that through our sports programs, that's exactly what we're doing. We're pushing people out into the front who, and they're, you know, their voices are being heard, um, they're being seen, they're being included, and it's, it's, they're being recognized that, you know, they're also equal members of our society, of our country, of our town. Um, and it's just helping to, to break down further boundaries. And it's, it's changing. I mean, having I've been in this country since 2008 and I'm, I've seen tremendous changes uh, on this movement. And I think it's only gonna continue to grow. And it's not just even in sports, but it, it, I think that sports has such a large voice here that it's helping to push the message out. We've spoken about how sports connects people together, how sports sort of sets a precedent which helps people come together, which helps people understand each other's stories, each other's struggles and helps the broader movements, which is whether it's the feminist movement or the disability rights movement. But like everything else, sports also, and sports diplomacy specifically has its own drawbacks. So let's talk a little about these drawbacks and how we can overcome them with a solution-oriented approach. Uh, Dr. LeMay, perhaps you can get us started by talking about some of the drawbacks that you've noticed and how you think we can overcome them. Well, I would say I've been fascinated by this discussion because so often when we talk about sports diplomacy, or for that matter, in the academic literature on it, it focuses on major international sporting events for which many of the claims are both dubious, uh, and many of them are moral, and I don't think the evidence supports them. The kind of sports diplomacy that's particularly interesting is the kinds of things Ryan described at the outset and that we've been talking about, these community-based approaches. One of your questions uh, that you put to us earlier was about civil society. Sports is kind of the essence of civil society, a healthy civil society. Uh, and it's at the bottom of the whole sport peace and development movement. Uh, all of this needs more empirical research, but it's at that level where I think sports diplomacy is particularly powerful. When you get up at the level of sports mega events and you're talking about intensive media coverage, that could completely backfire on you. Um, uh, just you know, look at the coverage that China is already getting for uh, Beijing 2022, a year out. So um, uh, there, are, there are downsides to sports diplomacy, uh, and, but I, I suppose they have to be managed. How do you think we can manage them? Well, I have one view of this that's not wildly popular, but I mean, here in Qatar, the, the one piece of sports diplomacy that's missing from Qatar's uh, bag of tools is effective storytelling. Um, you know, uh, if you look at BN, for example, uh, you know, the largest sports broadcaster in the world that does no storytelling. It just buys rights and airs games. Compare that to ESPN, for example, the US network, uh, which just did uh, the Michael Jordan documentary, which was watched around the world. That kind of sports storytelling goes a long way. And it's not, so that's what's missing here. And, um, uh, you know, until that changes, I think that's a really missing piece in Qatar's story. In fact, if Qatar doesn't tell its own story, as I've said before, the New York Times and the Guardian will do it for you. So uh, that would be my answer to your question. That's interesting. Can I add more? Yes, go ahead. As he explained it, the diplomacy from my perspective is a start from the house in the beginning and with your family. And uh, after that, it will go from the society then, the government then to the world. And I want to add it is the same thing. In our life, if you have any problem like that, you go in some, if you have a medical issue, you will go to the hospital. But in a sport, and if you have some problem in your, in your social life, you will go to the life coach. So in my in a sport, in, uh, in my life, in, in the sport, we see that we don't have any counselor or some life coaching related to the sport. Like if you gra gradually, you are going to the higher level, there is no counseling with experience or like a degree related to the sport, life sport, life uh, coaching to the sport. 
So I saw in the beginning, the diplomacy is a start, as I said, in the house, then you will go to invest your people and represent your country and you represent your identity. Then you will see the other people. In these stages, you will learn it in your life. But there is no one can teach us that you will face these things and make your life short to that sport. And instead, if you're taking in the long way, that I saw it in, in the sport. I don't know in other people and they can share their experience. I think what you just said is really important because we need to begin these conversations at home. And as Dr. LeMay said earlier, tell these stories, talk to each other about them. And I think here's where Dr. Raisha's project of those podcasts comes in. Uh, Dr. Raisha, could you talk to us a little about, um, you know, what you think are some of the limitations? And you mentioned it a little earlier where sports are used to exacerbate conflicts. Um, but if you could talk a little about some more limitations and how you think we can overcome them. Well, when it comes to uh, Qatar, I mean, it's interesting to look at research on previous mega sporting events and uh, plenty of studies show that a mega sporting event is not automatically leading to an increase in sporting participation in a country. So we cannot just like wait for the World Cup and think then all problems that we have uh, on the domestic level in sport are resolved. Uh, so um, uh, uh, there is a lot needs to be done and a lot is done in Qatar like uh, with the National Sports Day. I mean, this is one of the few countries that has such a public holiday. Um, so a lot of progress has been made when it comes to the uh, sporting infrastructure, when it comes to the government resources dedicated to the promotion of sports. Certainly the field where most work is still needed is women's sport. Um, because what we can see in the case of Qatar that the country is rapidly modernizing, uh, the infrastructure is becoming overnight that of an advanced country. I enjoy myself the metro uh, almost every day, uh, but changing a culture is, is a longer term process and uh, uh, many families are still a bit hesitant of uh, allowing their daughter certain sports. So this is why uh, uh, role models such as Amal are uh, so important uh, and I'm uh, so uh, grateful that she is with us today. So we need, uh, we need more of uh, 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 more people like Amal, you know, uh, who, who inspire uh, other girls to do sport. But the whole thinking needs to change uh, in, in, uh, in uh, on, uh, we, there are cultural obstacles and we need to keep telling uh, and convincing people that sport is a human right and everybody should be able to choose the sport he or she is practicing. Uh, and I think, um, I hope that um, the conversation today, but many other conversations happening now will contribute to that. Absolutely, the starting point is exactly where we are at today. Talking about these things, beginning these conversations, having these conversations, regardless of how difficult they may be, because every country, um, every sport, and I think every issue has to undergo this process of discussion, of evolution, and of reconsideration and unlearning biases. Um, Kathleen, can you tell us a little about your experience? What do you think are some of the drawbacks and how do you think we can overcome them? Um, yeah, we have definitely faced challenges. I mean, on a from a personal side, when I kind of started pushing disability inclusion in sport, people said to me, you're crazy, like an American girl in your swimsuit, the locals are not going to respond to you. And I said, okay, that's okay, they might not. And they didn't, it took a while, but I kept knocking on the doors. And finally, you know, they, they started opening the doors and inviting us in and, and you know, off we went. Um, but it really took a lot of um, time, a lot of conversations and a lot of education on my part. Cultural awareness too was a big thing. Just, I couldn't just be a big bossy American and get my way here. I really had to learn to navigate culturally how to, 
kind of get these programs implemented. But now we're seeing buy-in. Um, there's still challenges. There's challenges, um, as Amal mentioned, some of the family, you know, families might not be supportive, but even bigger than that, we have some government challenges. We have, we don't, there are not a lot of laws kind of protecting what we're trying to do. We have uh, co corporate challenges. We have facilities that aren't accessible. Um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, structural challenges in the country. We say we want to include everybody in sport, but the reality is they're not, they're not all accessible. Some are, and some are getting better. Um, but there are just day-to-day -day challenges to, to implement what we're saying we want to do. So we kind of have these high-level strategies, but we also have to make sure as a country we have the ability to, to get them. We need legs to, to reach those strategies. We need to constantly work towards this change. We need to remain persistent and we need to continue to spread our message. I to something what... with Catherine. Actually, this challenge is, is help us. Uh, without this challenge, we cannot move forward. From my perspective, Absolutely. I'm saying, yes, with, uh, before uh, Qatar is, uh, was hosting for 10 years after she take the 2022, uh, they have the gap for the 10 years. So everything in have a positive and negative. Way. For From my perspective, the positive and negative, they are connected together. We, we know that there will be a challenges first and for Qatar and in the Arab world. But we was ready and we was they putting with this challenging the plan how to solve these things and how to implement it. So uh, for, I was so proud to be in this, uh, my country and the World Cup. But if we see it before 10 years, the female participation in the sport in Qatar, especially there was less. But now if you see it, we have a female now going to the FIBA and licensing and they sharing their experience around the world even if they are four to five, instead of before 10 years, there was zero, there is no one. Also the mega events is help us to host this, like this mega events help us to be ready and ready for anything. So Absolutely. Yeah, media ready does for play, Media does play a very significant role in shaping how we view sports and in shaping how we interact with athletes. Yes, so um, from my perspective, I'm seeing this challenging is good for us we will look for the solution and implementation which fit to our to our country and our culture and our society definitely uh, media does play a great role and will continue to play a great role in shaping these narratives in giving voice to these perspectives uh, Dr. Lemay, can you talk to us a little about the significance of Qatar hosting the 2022 World Cup? Why is it important? What is it showing us? What is the larger trend it is alluding to? And how will it impact Qatar's civil society? Sorry, Doctor, you are muted. Thank you. Uh, there's several different questions there, Kansa, but um, uh, the most important one, of course, is the geography. This will be the first uh, World Cup in the Arab world, uh, following on World Cups, I think in successive World Cups, we've had them in Africa in 2010. Is that correct? South Africa is 2010. And then uh, Rio in 2016. So uh, my dates aren't quite right there, but the point is uh, football is moving around the world and the numbers uh, I, I should also confess that my idea of football is the American variety. Try as I might, I, I struggle with the other one. But the numbers tell a huge story about how important an event like this is. Uh, FIFA has, I think, 211 national members. Uh, the IOC has 205, and World Athletics has 215. And what's extraordinary about these numbers is that according to the UN, there's only 195 countries in the world. So somebody didn't get the memo that they're not a country. So the mere fact that these events are so compelling uh, for uh, people who have, have a story to tell about their country or their national identity is a huge part of the events themselves. What I understand, uh, the World Cup being hosted here sort of gives Qatar an opportunity to tell their story 
and become a part of the larger movement that sports really alludes to, as we discussed earlier. Uh, Dr. Gaisha, what do you think is the significance of Qatar hosting this World Cup for Qatar and also for uh, the progression of civil society on the whole? Well, I think uh, hosting the World Cup is for Qatar mainly a foreign policy tool uh, to, to brand the country, to, to have a better reputation in the international uh, arena, but also for national security, you know, and uh, I mean, uh, maybe uh, Qatar would have already been invaded by a neighboring country without uh, all this sporting events taking place in the country. So uh, for Qatar, it's a strategic tool to build relations with uh, other countries in the world. Of course, the FIFA World Cup 2022, as uh, Dr. Ramey rightfully said, is also showcasing that uh, football became maybe the only truly global sport that has reached all corners in the world. And it's the first World Cup in the Arab world, which is uh, remarkable. Uh, the changes for Qatar, I mean, first of all, the infrastructure. It puts a lot of spotlight on Qatar. So uh, I'm not sure whether all the policy changes that we witnessed now were intended uh, once. Uh, but we see now, for example, in the labor market, a lot of reforms. We see that, uh, you know, as Amal said, uh, women's sport is better promoted. When it comes to civil society, I mean, this is a country with a top down decision making processes. Uh, but still, I think uh, now we have a discussion on like volunteering opportunities for our students in uh, 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 Qatar, um, in education city universities for the World Cup. So I think uh, there are some um, developments and opportunities uh, for engagement uh, at the World Cup. Amal, as a female athlete, what do you think is the significance of Qatar hosting the World Cup and where do you see it going from here in terms of Qatar's future with sports? Actually, it's have a big significance and affecting in our country. First of all, it will be, it's, uh, we are seeking to the diversity of economic growth. With this mega events that we are hosting and also um, the international events that will giving us for our people to see that Qatar is ready to uh, increase their economic uh, growth, uh, not only by the gas, also by the mega events. Also the number of uh, tourists they will be here, they will bring their significant amount of income to the, our country. This is from the economy. The other, uh, the other thing that we are uh, following, the Our Highness for the Vision 2030, that we need to invest in our people and our youth that take them to the second level and be with the, the European and the American and also the Arab world that Qatar, they can host any mega event and they are highly educated, highly skillful and highly ready for any events. So I'm seeing this one after the finishing of the World Cup, we are ready inshallah for any mega events in coming in the future. So I'm thinking that one also changing in both male and female side also for the new generation, and we will have putting like a legacy in our country. So the legacy- Can I please add what Amal said, sure. just one sentence. It would be so great if we have in the future also a FIFA uh, a Women's World Cup or a FIBA Women's World Cup in Qatar, you know? That would be fantastic. Yeah, the sure. Legacy. We will the we love and uh, I think we will uh, put this file to the Olympic Committee to discuss it and why not to host it. The legacy and implications of this World Cup are immense. So there's a lot of room for improvement. There's a lot of room for evolution. And there are a lot of places we can go to. So Kathleen, as a developer of the Ability Friendly Program, can you tell us a little about the kind of expertise you brought here from the United States? And where do you think we can use expertise? How do you think we can evolve more? I think that the best thing that we can do is continue to push our message at the same time providing education and training opportunities for other sports coaches, other sports programs, other professionals interested in this field to 
kind of level up their skills. Um, we need to have more people with the ability to provide sports opportunities for the disabled population here. Um, you know, you, we've mentioned our long waiting list, which is true. And that just shows that there's also a lack of other options for people to get involved. And, and we wanna provide those options. We see that as a responsibility of ours. And we are working on that. We're introducing some kind of train the, train the trainer programs, training other coaches programs, um, working within schools to help level up, you know, PE teachers qualifications and, and confidence. Um, it, there's just so much potential here. And we're, you know, we're committed to pushing forward with all of it. We're, we would love to see Qatar as a fully inclusive society and, and sports to us is, is the way to start that. You know, just with the World Cup coming here, it's, it's kind of provided a platform for a lot of these kind of like grassroots programs, our programs to, to, to take a bigger step forward just because of the spotlight that is on sports and, and Qatar. And so we're, we're excited about the possibilities. Exactly, the possibilities are immense and we hope that going forward, we can see a lot of positive evolution when it comes to inclusivity and when it comes to the impact of sports diplomacy. So one last question for Dr. LeMay and Dr. Raishe. Dr. LeMay, Qatar and the United States have a very strong relationship. How do you see this manifested into the world of sports and how do you see it evolving for the better with the approach of the World Cup and going forward just generally? Well, the programs that Ryan described at the outset were particularly interesting to me. There's a long history of US sports diplomacy at this level where you know the real ambassadors are the athletes uh, and now a greater range of athletes. But the relationship between Qatar and the United States is rich with potential because you know Qatar has made sports a pillar of its uh, uh, development plan along with media education and uh, art but then the United States is by far the largest sports market in the world it's about 46 percent of global sports so if you between the two countries you should think they would have a lot to share. Dr. Raishi would you like to add on anything uh, about how you see this relationship in evolve and where do you think it's going to go from here? Yeah, I mean, Qatar and the U.S. have very close relationships. There is a U.S. military base here. We have U.S. universities uh, such as Northwestern and Georgetown here in Education City. Um, but, you know, uh, for sport now, uh, the next two World Cups are in Qatar and in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. We just had a debate with the U.S. Qatar Business Council on the upcoming two World Cups. So I think this is really a chance uh, for... Um, uh, uh, dialogue and to learn from each other. And I think that um, Qatar sets the bar very high with this World Cup when it comes to the sustainability of the events, the stadiums, how they are built, um, the accessibility, um, uh, public transportation towards the game. So there's a lot to learn from Qatar. Uh, in return, I think Qatar can learn from the US, uh, particularly in the field of women's sport. I mean, the uh, US might be the most equal sporting society in the world. When we look at the opportunities female athletes have in colleges, um, for example, uh, where universities give the same number of uh, sports scholarships to female than to male students. So, I think it can be learned a lot from each other. And I really hope that um, uh, in the US, um, there is much interest in Qatar's experiences of the FIFA World Cup 2022, because I think a lot is done very well, particularly when it comes to the sustainability of the event. So it's really a mutually beneficial relationship where both countries can learn from one another and both countries can grow with one another. So thank you so much for sharing to all our panelists. We are grateful for your participation. We really appreciate all that you've brought to the table here. And we really appreciate all that our audience have been able to learn from you. But it's time for us to engage with our audience to hear about their perspectives, to hear their questions, and to help answer what they 
want to learn from us. So um, let's just hear from our audience. Let's give them an opportunity to interact with us. And I know there is a lot that I wanted to ask you and a lot that you wanted to say. Um, but before we conclude, let's just uh, hear from our audience. Ms. Cecile, do we have any questions? Yes, so there is a question to Professor Lame. Um, uh, uh, so Abdurrahman Naimi, he is honored to be here and he asks, with sports diplomacy in mind, could you please tell us how does the FIFA World Cup bridge cultures and why is it so important for Qatar? Uh, well, part of that I've discussed a little bit earlier and that it sport does like no other institution I can think of bridge cultural and linguistic differences. So people can come together and enjoy an event uh, that they all know and they all play and none of them speak the same language. Sport also provides a uh, unofficial reason for international leaders in politics and business to meet and to talk. Um, and you can actually have some genuine diplomatic discussions there. Think of uh, North and South Korea, for example, uh, in the Olympics. Um, so, so I would say basically that's, that would be my short answer to that question. Dr. Kaishi, would you like to add on anything? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have seen over the last years when there was a blockade um, that uh, football <laughs> remained one of the last communication uh, platforms between the countries involved uh, in the blockade. So for example, in the 2019, uh, Arab Golf Cup, uh, the blockading countries would come to Doha and participate in the tournament, which shows the potential of sports that uh, when you know that it's one of the last areas where uh, countries might meet. And um, so uh, for the future, of course, um, 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 one could also consider uh, from a Qatari perspective to co-host with other countries in the region uh, events to uh, further improve uh, the relations and to prevent uh, such crises happening as we just witnessed uh, from 2017 to early this year. Thank you. Mrs. Seal, next question. Thank you so much. Yes, the other question is related to uh, involving sports in curriculum. So other than the PE class, how can we better mainstream the study of sports in the rest of the school or college curriculum? Dr. Lemay? I'm not sure if I have a good answer to that, but I, I actually, I will say that as a parent and as a former athlete, I think it should be done. Uh, physical education is where a lot of kids quit sports forever uh, because the instruction is so poor. And I've always thought that if you were going to coach young children, you should have a license to do it. This is my inner father speaking. But I also, you know, there's, uh, to, to, there's lots of opportunity for education and sports, both as a social institution, but also in terms of uh, uh, physical and mental wellness. Um, so how exactly it's integrated into a curriculum, uh, that's, a, that's a project for, for administrators and governments. Amal, as an athlete, do you think there's a specific way to go about this? From my perspective, I think yes, because uh, the physical education is different for the athletic, the experience that they have. So uh, from my perspective, the curriculum for the physical education, first they have to learn and play the game or play the things they teach for the students. And to be at least uh, like if you're playing basketball, at least you know the rule and regulation in each sport that you're teaching for the students or read about it, no need the specific to play it, but read about it and understand it, you can pass the knowledge and the experience to the students. After that, they know what kind of sport they want to play in the future. Because in the schools, we can take the, the uh, from the schools, we take these students to be a professional player in the future. And like that, we need to uh, raise the education and raise the experience for the physical education teachers and put a good program for them to follow for all of them. Absolutely. Dr. Haisha, would you like to add on anything? 
Yeah, of course, uh, sport uh, can be integrated also in other subjects. For example, history. I think when I was in high school, half of my history classes were on the Second World War. But of course, that's also related to the fact that I'm German. So I would have loved to learn about the history of the Olympic Games, for example, uh, or study the FIFA World Cup, and it's important for the world. And uh, I think sport gives so many opportunities to, to, to study issues around race, gender, etc., in an interesting way that is appealing to students. And on college level, I think something that we might uh, want to discuss in the future, whether we want to give our students opportunity to, to get some credits in uh, PE classes, at least on a voluntary level. That's actually a really interesting idea. Um, Kathleen, would you like to add on anything? I don't think I heard the first part of what he said, but um, absolutely. There, I think there's two things. I think that there needs to be just more exposure. I think there needs to be um, programs, sports programs that are financially affordable for people and inclusive for people so that there is just more exposure across the country. You know, there are a lot of kids uh, football or soccer programs here, um, but there aren't a ton of other sports. So I think that we just need to kind of widen the exposure to what is available and make that available both financially and ability level, ability wise, make that make just make them possible because you never know what sport you're going to gravitate towards. You never know what you're going to excel at unless you're exposed to it. Now, kind of looking at, at the universities in the country, there is, you know, there are a couple of sports programs, but also the universities could, could we, there could be more, there could be more programs in sports management or recreation and sport. Um, and that would also help further drive the interest. I studied, you know, both of those things in the US and that has help, only helped me here be able to implement those kind of programs was having that you know, kind of education around sports management um, and be able to implement things here. But there aren't, uh, we just need more opportunities. There still needs to be more done here to help make it uh, more accessible for everybody. Thank you. May, may, may I add a thought? Go you ahead. know, when I first got into sports scholarship, I was surprised to find that it's a relatively new field. 40 years ago, nobody studied sports. That was pop culture. Uh, and now it's in all the professional schools, law, business, medicine. And when you study sport, it touches every discipline, economics, sociology, anthropology, history. Sports is a fascinating tool, as Daniel said, to explore all kinds of topics in ways that are interesting uh, to all kinds of students. Thank you so much. Um, absolutely, I agree with you and I think just the fact that it is so inclusive and it is so broad yet so specific at the same time um, is one of the main takeaways for me from this topic because I'm not very inclined towards sports but I think after this I, I realize I have a lot to learn when that is concerned. Um, Mrs. Seal, next question. Yes, so there is a question for Ms. Amal. Uh, so can you speak about your effort for the inclusion of faith symbols like the hijab in international sports? Yeah, sure. Uh, when, we, when I was playing basketball since until we start taking the medals 2008, and there is a rule in the FIBA that uh, we are not allowed to wear hijab and you will wear it something like five meters in here. After that, we, we taking a gold medals, after you taking in the Gulf, you will go into the Arab, then you will go into the Asia. After that, we cannot go in that further. So we stuck only in the Gulf. We asked to go to other countries to play because we are now skillful and we can play with the Asian and Arab tournaments. After that, we went to Ancient 2014. We was there in the Korea Asian game. They saw what, that we are wearing hijab, five of us were wearing hijab and they said, it's not allowed. We asked, okay, what is not allowed in basketball only? There is, they said, because you're playing like, it's very harm player. We said, how come it's very harm? We are every touch there is a foul and I'm, I am a FIBA referee. They said, no, they, I said, what about the handball? They were in hijab, what about the football? They were in hijab, what about the self-defense? 
sport. They were in hijab. After that, they have a doubt. And uh, in 2014, we came back to Qatar and we, we make like a campaign, a small campaign. It's affect us with, this is our culture and sport is not have any identity or it's not having any religion. You have to see my sport in my skill only, not seeing my hijab and what I'm wearing. That time it's give us a good challenge to change this rule from the FIBA. We will discuss it with a big campaign all around the world. Uh, even uh, most of the famous players in the US and uh, Atbal also who was playing the fence also she support us. And uh, most of them, they said, no, we have to change this rule. After that, in three years, after the campaign, the FIBA, he came by himself to Qatar and he want to see our hijab, how is it? SubhanAllah, he didn't know about the wearing of the hijab. He said, I didn't see it before. I said, it's not like that because he didn't see our religion and how we're wearing, it's not African. SubhanAllah, in 2017, it's changed. And we went to the first Asian three by three in 2017. So from that campaign, from that challenge in 2014, we changed and we move forward. Now also the referee, they have also to ref with the hijab. So everything now is open. It was a big challenge, but uh, I like challenging to change the things for people who don't know our religion. Because the sport, as, it, as I said before, is the, it's not having any religion. It's only see my skill. If I'm a skillful, okay, at least see my sport. Thank you so much for sharing. I think that's a really, really powerful story. Just showing us what the impact of our advocacy can be and how it can affect so many people who want to advocate for it, who want their identity not to be questioned when, you know, concerning sports or any other um, thing really. So just thank you for your advocacy and thank you for sharing. Uh, Mrs. Cecile, next question. We'll, we will entertain one more question um, in the interest of time. Yeah, so there is a question that talks about the values that um, uh, are learned through uh, playing sports and exercising. So how uh, can we as youth use those skills developed in sports in the professional world when it comes to applying them to work and our social life. Thank you. Um, Kathleen, would you like to begin answering this question? Sure. I think that, you know, being involved in sports, it teaches you from a young age, uh, teamwork teaches you how to be on a team that's not natural to everybody. I think you learn how to work together. It, there's so many skills that are transferable just to, just to life. Um, learning how to, you know, follow the rules or to negotiate or to, you, you learn how to win, you learn how to lose. You know, these are all lessons that have been, have been brought forward to me through, through being on, involved in sports. Um, in addition to the physical benefits, you know, the mental benefits and the social benefits, my, some of my, you know, greatest friends and are, are, from sport, you know, not not people that you work with, but maybe people that you are involved in sports with. I just, the, the benefits are just absolutely um, endless. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lemay, would you like to add on to this? Uh, with respect to the values that sports teaches, I, I think you learn that as an athlete. That's actually why when you asked me at the outset, my introduction to this whole field, the fact that I was an athlete was hugely valuable to me personally. And I'm still an athlete, and that's very important to who I am. But it's also, it's funny, as a professor, I can tell you that over the years at Northwestern, where we have, you know, a big time sports program, I've always admired my students who are athletes. They're never late to class. They never make an excuse. They never turn into Simon Slade. I would hire them in a heartbeat if I was an employer, and I have been one, just because they know that sort of discipline uh, that is invaluable in the workplace. Thank you. If there are any Northwestern students uh, taking this class uh, with uh, Dr. LeMay, so, uh, you know, you guys are in good hands and you guys are probably getting jobs after this. Um, Dr. Raishi. I think Qatar is a very academically oriented society. Um, but what we need is a holistic approach and a holistic way of thinking. So one cannot study around the clock. 
and you can only do well in college when you also work out, when you do sports. And uh, I mean, I really love my job, but at the very end, it's a bit of boring because I'm sitting the whole day, I'm reading, I'm writing. So if I would not do different sports, I would get crazy. So it's really important, I think, for each of us to do sports and to raise the awareness of the benefits of sports, not just on the elite level, for every one of us. Everyone should do sports and should try to identify the sports that he or she likes most and practice it. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing. I think, um, you know, with Zoom fatigue, getting real with us sitting in front of technology the entire day. I think what you said is especially valuable in this pandemic because it's important for us to find, you know, ways that we can express ourselves physically, uh, ways that we can get out our anger, our emotions and everything in a healthy manner. So just thank you for sharing. Um, can I add for sorry, one sentence? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sports from my side, most of the people they see who, who, who not do sport before, sport as a job. From our side, the people athletic or who was an experience with the sport, the sport they seeing as a spiritual, as we say, social life, communication life, we seeing sport life, it's a life. It's a life, you're all physical, mental, social, communication, media, everything. It's a life like it's another world to other people who involve in sport doing a sport it's like moving in our blood you cannot stop doing the sport and it's help a lot in your mind first and second in your physical because both they are connected before they thinking the sport is only for physical but now it's mental they both of them they are connected it's good in giving you a good motivation good uh, hormonal changing and good for long life also from my perspective i said the sport is a life it's another job it's a spiritual life now Thank you for sharing. I, I think that's a lot of motivation for us to begin working out if we don't. But uh, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for becoming a part of this conversation. I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, so thank you for bringing your expertise, for bringing your opinions, and thank you to our audience for engaging with us. Um, we look forward to seeing you again as panelists and we look forward to seeing our audience again in our next panel in March. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye -bye. Also. Bye.